So I originally wanted to do an episode going through Stranger Things and calculating what level all the characters would be if they were a party in Dungeons and Dragons. Considering all the monsters they've beaten, all the adventures they've gone on, all the Soviets they've outsmarted, they've gotta be getting up there in the levels, right? Like level 15 at least. So I busted out some old rule books for the ancient first edition advanced D&D that was around back when the show takes place and did some calculations. And then... I learned that basically no one has gotten anywhere. Apparently leveling up in classic D&D was just really heckin' hard. The only character that's done enough to level up throughout the entire show is Hopper. Turns out that beating up all those guards and Soviets, killing a horde of Demogorgons, and looting a whole freaking snowmobile added up just over one level's worth of XP. Just one level! But don't worry, Hop. Vecna's only considered to be a demigod of greater power. I have no doubt that a level 2 fighter can beat him. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that's always running up that hill called the YouTube Algorithm. Today, we're journeying into the Upside Down with all our favorite kids from Hawkins, Indiana. Though, can we even call them kids at this point? With how much time there is between seasons of this thing, Dustin over here is looking like he's ready to put a down payment on his first mortgage. Honestly, though, it's not just the kids who've grown up, either. It's wild to think just how much the Stranger Things franchise has grown since it first premiered. I mean, this thing started as a mid-budget homage to classic 80s movies, and now it's got a budget that's larger than not only those cinematic classics, but also modern day blockbusters. Seriously, Netflix spent $270 million on Stranger Things Season 4. Compare that to the biggest movie of 2022 so far, Top Gun Maverick, that thing had a budget of only $170 million. How do you even afford that? Well, don't worry, Netflix has got themselves a plan. You know, they could have taken my advice from a previous episode, but nah, they've got a better idea. They're betting the farm on a Stranger Things pop-up shop in Paris. So what sort of things do you think you can buy in Stranger Things the store? Wow, look at all that specialty merch, like trucker hats. Gotta be honest with you, Netflix, some tells me that you might need to do a bit more than sell a few t-shirts to break even on this one. Now, in case you've somehow missed one of the biggest streaming shows ever, Stranger Things is the story of four nerdy friends. Five nerdy friends. Six? Seven? Eight? Netflix, slow down! It's no wonder the budget for this thing is so huge. You're adding, like, three new ongoing main characters every season. Anyway, every season, this small football team's worth of nerds are tasked with trying to save themselves, their hometown, and the world from the Upside Down, a dark mirror dimension full of spooky, scary monsters. But despite having more than enough warm bodies to throw at the nearest threat, every season ultimately boils down to one character, Eleven, a young girl with incredible psychic powers and terrible arts and crafts powers. And for my visual aid, I made a Dirayama of our cabin. Oh yeah, and sometimes some of them go to Russia and stay there for way too long. Seriously, you had an out written into the story. Why did you double down, guys? Uh, sorry, just had to get that off my chest. If you know, you know. Anyway, the newest season introduced us to basically the final boss of the whole show, the bone-breakingly powerful Vecna, another powerful psychic coming from the same training program as Eleven. This guy is scary, and he immediately makes a huge first impression. But even more incredible is the fact that he's been teased in the series since episode one of of season one. Notice the key turning right here? Yeah, the big bad of season one is the Demogorgon, and that's not a psychic monster. That right there has to be Vecna's doing. Also, you got this clock noise that's heard before Will enters the Upside Down. How cool is that? In the opening minutes, we're teased about this guy who only appears a couple seasons later. TLDR here, the show's been building to his reveal for a long time. They even show that Vecna's been the one actively controlling all the other monsters from the previous seasons. In short, this dude is a big deal. Which means that no matter how long you stand there with your arm outstretched, Eleven, it ain't gonna work. And we see this in the season's final episode. Despite being lit on fire, shot point blank with a shotgun, having parts of his hive mind severed, and falling several stories out a window, Vecna escapes, and he'll be back for the final season. Will makes that abundantly clear. I can feel him, and he's hurt. He's hurting. But he's still alive. So, what else can our lovable team of geeks do? How do you kill this seemingly unkillable foe? Well, I think that we actually have a blueprint for exactly how to beat this guy thanks to a little game called Dungeons and Dragons. This tabletop RPG is obviously core to the lore of Stranger Things. Oh, Jesus, we're so screwed if it's the Demogorgon. It's not the Demogorgon. An army of troglodytes charge into the chamber. Troglodytes. Told you. 
<laughs> but I'm not sure many people realize just how influential it's been. So today we're gonna look at the pieces Stranger Things has set up throughout the series and examine the lore of the franchise through the lens of D&D to tell you exactly what Vecna's plan is and how they're ultimately gonna stop him. Spoiler alert! Our lovable gang from Hawkins, Indiana are gonna have to make a couple horrible sacrifices to do it. Millie Bobby Brown, the actress playing Eleven, she recently said in an interview that she wished that the show had more deaths. Well, let me be the first to tell her she's gonna get them this next season. In fact, I have a strong suspicion as to who's gonna die next season, and their deaths won't be completely pointless like Eddie's. Side note, loved Eddie as a character. It's cool and all that you got to do that epic guitar solo, but seriously, these guys are smarter than that. They thought through their plan. They could have just set up a tape to play on top of a speaker system. And don't even get me started on the whole I need to buy them time thing. No, just no. Hashtag justice for Eddie. He was too cool and too smart. He deserved a better death. <sighs> okay, rant over. So, can I predict the ending of a show whose ending hasn't even been written yet? And likely won't air for at least another year and a half when Mike is old enough to join AARP? Hop on your trailers, friends. Today we're shredding some lore. So, first off, just to be clear, Stranger Things has made no effort to hide how much of its mythology is inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, all of its main monsters are straight up named after famous D&D enemies. But names aren't the only thing that they borrow. The basic concepts behind the D&D monsters are also incorporated into the Stranger Things iterations. Think about it like that meme where you copy your friend's homework, but you change it just enough so you won't get into trouble. If you want an example, just take a look at Season 3's Mind Flayer. In the game, Mind Flayers are illithid, tentacle-faced creatures from a different plane of existence that operate a hive mind, telepathically controlling intelligent creatures as minions and reproducing via creepy slugs that infect the brains of host bodies. Now, take a look at Stranger Things. Their Mind Flayer is a hive mind, check, from a different plane of existence, check, that often takes the form of creatures with tentacles, check, it has the ability to control the minds of people, like we see with Billy, check, and the Demogorgons controlled by the Mind Flayer will reproduce with gross slugs that live in hosts like Will. <coughs> Check again. And this pattern holds true for Vecna, too. If you played D&D, you knew that things were about to get serious the second they revealed the dude's name. In the game, Vecna is a lich, basically an absurdly powerful undead wizard. He also holds the title Master of the Spider Throne. Cool name, terrible building material for a throne. He's also the closest thing to a Thanos that you're gonna get in D&D. In one of the most famous Vecna stories, the adventure starts with him killing the Council of Eight, a collection of the strongest sorcerers in the entire world. Talk about making your presence known. For a while, the only parts of Vecna that remained in the world of D&D were his eye and his hand, and those alone were considered legendary artifacts with the ability to grant incredibly evil powers. The long and short of all of this is, while we can't look at D&D lore as a hard blueprint for exactly what's gonna happen, we can use it as a sort of cheat sheet to get an idea of where the show might be headed to next. So, how does all of that map onto Stranger Things? Well, as I just mentioned, Vecna is the true ruler of the Upside Down, but he's not native to it. He's actually a human boy named Henry Creel. The very first child to become part of the experiments where Eleven honed her powers. This, in turn, gave him the moniker One. It's killing back now. Slash Henry. Slash one. He might not be a powerful wizard, but he is a powerful psychic. He may not sit atop a spider throne, but he does like spiders. And just like D&D's Vecna killed the other mages in the Council of Eight, One in Stranger Things killed all the other powerful kids in the psychic experiments to start his story. In fact, Eleven gets so angry in this moment that she basically tears him apart. It's only once he's in the Upside Down that he's able to to regain his strength. In short, Henry is quite literally killed and then reborn. In a lot of ways, you could say that he's undead, just like Vecna the Lich. And remember the whole eye and hand being powerful artifact thing from D&D? Well, Vecna in the show is shown with one enlarged hand and is just oozing with eye imagery. The parallels here are very clear. And this is even looking past how Stranger Things' as Vecna looks an awful lot like some incarnations of the D&D character. So a lot of that lines up really well. And that naturally got me asking, what else in Vecna's D&D lore can we look at to figure out what the next season is gonna do. Well, most iterations of the character have one major goal, to become a god. Vecna's been trying to do it for basically as long as he's been around, and he's even succeeded in some D&D storylines. That's also gonna be Vecna's goal in Stranger Things, as one explains in season four. Imagine what we could do together. We could reshape the world, remake it however we see fit. He's likely gonna do this by transporting a great deal of the Upside Down out into the real world, if what Nancy sees in her vague vision of the future is to be believed. He showed me things that haven't happened yet. There were so many monsters, an army, and they were coming into Hawkins. And this actually lines up with perhaps the most popular iteration of the character, one that predates Stranger Things. I'm talking about Vecna's appearance as the villain from the massively popular D&D livestream Critical Role. He wasn't really going to offer information anyway. Who are you? Standing by the doorway, you see there, arms crossed, 
casually, standing before you, Vecna. What? Now, before you bring it up, yes, Critical Role is independent from D&D's publisher, Wizards of the Coast, but because of its popularity, Wizards frequently references the events of Critical Role as part of D&D canon. In short, the stories of Critical Role and their version of Vecna are absolutely parts of the D&D canon that we can look at to chart the future of Stranger Things. And in that story, Vecna bides his time building his power in a realm called the Shadowfell, a dark reflection of the real world often associated with spider gods. Dark reflections of the real world filled with spider-like things, you say. Hmm. In the end, Vecna teleports his entire army from the Shadowfell out to the real world, attacking a major city before the heroes stop him. So, I expect that Stranger Things is gonna follow that basic outline as well. But the bigger question is obviously not what he's gonna do, but rather what do you do to stop him? Is there anything in the D&D lore that can tell us what our main characters need to do? Thankfully, yes. In fact, the way to stop Vecna is foundational to his lore. You see, one constant across every incarnation of the character is that he's betrayed by his right-hand man, the vampire lord Koss the Bloody Handed. No! Vecna's dead! He killed my cat! So it was thought, my friends. So it was thought. See, Vecna made the classic bad guy mistake of trusting another bad guy, elevating Koss and granting him a powerful magic weapon that would eventually come to be known as the Sword of Koss. Of course, Koss eventually uses this sword to cut off Vecna's hand and rip out his eye before banishing him to another realm. In the present day, the Sword of Koss remains one of the only ways to destroy the remaining artifacts of Vecna. So clearly, Stranger Things is gonna have their own iteration of Koss. In fact, many online theorists think that they've already got a handle on who exactly the betrayer is gonna be. So let's quickly talk about that in a mini morty gonna talk about a popular theory for just a minute that's why we call it a mini morty a popular theory that's been floating around the old reddits is that the late, great Eddie Munson is gonna return as the show's iteration of Koss. According to them, Koss was most well known for using a sword, just like Eddie uses against the Demobats during the final battle. Koss was a vampire lord, creatures often associated with bats, and Eddie was killed by a swarm of Demobats. Plus, the choice of Metallica's Master of Puppets as the song that Eddie rocks out to could be foreshadowing that he'll be risen as Koss under Vecna's control. They specifically point to lyrics like, Master of Puppets, I'm pulling your strings, twisting your mind and smashing your dreams. And while I think I made it clear earlier just how much I'd love to see Eddie get some well-deserved justice, I just don't think the parallels here make a lot of sense. First off, yeah, Eddie uses a sword, I, I guess, but there's nothing special about that particular sword. If anything, Eddie's guitar was his much more iconic weapon. You could say that he's much more of a bard character who uses an axe. Secondly, well, yeah, he did die to Demobats, Steve also got bit real bad by the bats, so the connection isn't just with Eddie. Finally, the lyrical connection between Master of Puppets and Vecna is really cool, but the showrunners made it clear that Eddie's guitar solo wasn't originally planned. All they knew was that Eddie was just gonna distract the Demobats in some way. They didn't know how. The concert angle wasn't pitched until very late in the writing process after the main beats of the story, including Eddie's death, had already been set in stone. Master of Puppets was also chosen after the scene was conceived, partially because the lyrics, which describe drug addiction, not only matched up so well with Vecna, but also Eddie's past as a drug dealer. Do I think that Eddie might come back reincarnated or as a vision in some way? Sure, especially considering how popular he was this season. But do I think that he's Koss and will bring down Vecna? No. And the biggest reason for that actually has nothing to do with bats or swords. I think that there's already a far better candidate for Koss. One that's already completed part of the thematic arc for the character within D&D lore. Eleven. Yeah, I know. Shocking revelation that the main character might have the best shot at beating the main villain, but who else did you expect? See, one was the person that encouraged Eleven to embrace her powers, taking her on as his right-hand man in that way. It's his encouragement that ultimately ultimately helps her find herself. In our D&D comparison, that parallels the way Vecna uplifted Koss and gave him his sword. One even offers El a place at his side when he reveals his plan to take over the world, again, like their D&D counterparts. However, just like Vecna was betrayed by Koss, Eleven betrays One by using her powers, her sword, to rip open the very first portal into the Upside Down, throwing One inside, just like Koss banished Vecna. So, true to form, it's clear that this is the direction that they're taking with Eleven. And even if taking down Vecna is gonna be a team effort from the full cast, Elle and her powers are absolutely the sort of cost that's going to be needed to deliver the final blow. But there's one final piece to our puzzle here. Like I said when we first introduced the D&D bad guy, Vecna's a lich. And the thing about liches is that they're undead. They sacrifice their humanity for immortality, ripping their souls out of their bodies and putting them into magical objects called phylacteries. As long as a lich's phylactery remains intact, they literally cannot die. Think of a phylactery like a horcrux from Harry Potter. Now, just like other D&D concepts, Bar 
borrowed by Stranger Things. I don't think the show's Vecna literally ripped his soul out of his body and put it into a baseball or whatever. But with Vecna coming back next season despite being lit on fire, shot point blank with a shotgun, and falling several stories out of a window, I think it's safe to say that he may have himself some phylacteries lying around. So if the Hawkins gang want to put an end to Vecna once and for all, they're gonna have to find that phylactery and destroy it. Sadly, D&D lore is very secretive about what exactly their Vecna uses as his phylactery, so we're not gonna be able to find a clean equivalent within Stranger Things, but that doesn't mean that we can't figure it out. In fact, I think what Vecna's phylactery is on the show is kinda obvious. We already know that Vecna's connected to the Mind Flayer's hive mind, and that when he kills people with his powers, they join that hive mind and increase his strength. They're not gone, Eleven. They're still with me. Here. Likewise, when something like a Demogorgon dies, Vecna is weakened. So it would make sense that Eleven and the others would need to destroy that hive mind to weaken Vecna so he can be defeated. There's just one problem with that. There's someone else that's tapped into the hive mind. Will Byers. Ever since he was trapped in the Upside Down in Season 1, Will has had some sort of a connection to the realm, to the Mind Flayer, and now to Vecna. He begins seeing glimpses of it in the real world. He begins to draw the same spidery shape that Vecna was obsessed with when he was a child. More explicitly, in Season 2, Vecna and the Mind Flayer use Will as a vessel, possessing his body and puppeteering him like a marionette. And since then, Will can feel Vecna. He senses when he's in pain, or when he's nearby in the Upside Down. And that means that Will is likely a major part of that phylactery that'll need to be destroyed in order to kill Vecna. It also provides an added layer of bookending to know that the series started with a season-long mission to keep Will alive, but will end with a season-long mission that requires the team to kill him. And honestly, this is just a brilliant setup for a beautifully tragic story Line. Eleven has been welcomed into the Byers family as one of their own, an adopted daughter. They love Eleven, and Eleven loves them. And now she has to go and kill her own adopted brother. But of course, Will's not gonna be alone in this. There's a very real possibility that we're gonna lose a lot of our beloved idiots. Remember that vision of the future that Vecna showed Mike's sister Nancy? Well, parts of it have already explicitly come true. He showed me a dark cloud spreading over Hawkins downtown on fire. But the vision didn't stop there for Nancy. He showed me my mom, Holly, Mike, we were all that's right, if other parts of that foretelling come true, Mike is likely gonna eat it next season as well, which will destroy everyone who loves him. As they made explicitly clear this season, Mike is the leader. He's the heart of the team. See how you're leading us here? You're guiding the whole party, inspiring us. And see your coat of arms here? It's, it's a heart. That's what holds this whole party together, heart. So what better way for Vecna to strike than by ripping out the heart? By killing off the one character that gave Eleven the boost that she needed to overcome him. Here's the way that I see it all going down. The team realizes that Will is the final phylactery, the thing that's keeping Vecna alive, and that he has to die by Eleven's hand, her power, her sword of Koss. Except there's one problem, she can't do it. Will and her are like brother and sister. He's the one person who understands her. Sorry. It's gonna be okay. It's, it's not that bad. We'll fix it together. Okay. However, Mike and the rest of the family are killed during the final battle, dealing critical emotional damage to both Will and Eleven. Enraged and devastated, Eleven does what she has to do. She turns and kills Will, the boy that everyone on the show has been trying to keep alive since the very first episode. And this is the final act that allows Vecna to finally die. From there, you have to deal with the bittersweet aftermath. On one hand, the buyers are grateful that the world is saved, but at the same time, they can't be around Eleven, the one who took Will away from them. This then puts a strain on the relationship between Joyce and Hop. And the rest of the crew suddenly has to find their new roles without Mike, their heart, their team leader to guide them. And hey, this sets up some awesome sequel potential. I mean, Netflix has already announced that they are milking this cash cow as far as it'll go with a whole stinking production company called Upside Down Pictures. And a spinoff where an emotionally scarred adult Eleven travels the world getting up to psychic shenanigans in the waning years of the Cold War? Yep, seems like a pretty safe bet to me. Or, you know, I could be completely wrong and they just decide that they're gonna bring back that long lost sister of hers from that one random episode in season two. Nah, I don't think anyone, even Netflix, is that desperate. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.